okay i think i think we've got all the technical things figured out all right all right go us <laughs> Um, thank you everyone for joining us. It's a smaller audience here too, so I'll turn the camera in at the end so you can see everybody, but I keep on looking down there. You're down there for me, but um, thanks so much for coming, everyone. Um, Teresa wasn't feeling very well, so she's joined us um, remotely, so I know everyone can see her up there on the screen. Um, my name is Andy Smith with a and Mortgage. I'm a mortgage consultant here at the company that you're sat in, um, and I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I am Tony Freeman. Um, I'm currently with Keller Williams, um, and I you know, mainly work with a bunch of investors out here in Chicago. Um, big or small, multi-units, so. Cool. Yeah. Um, Teresa, I'll hand it over to you. You can introduce yourself as well. Everyone can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, please forgive the, the sound of my voice. I'm sorry. I have to subject you to this, but I wish I could be there in person. I'm with Midland Trust. I facilitate the 1031 exchanges for our company. So I'm excited to talk to you all today about 1031 exchanges and how they can possibly benefit real estate investors. Awesome. Thanks, Teresa. The funny thing is, Tony and I are actually working on a 1031 exchange right now. We are, yes. Um, we are? Yeah, closing, closing next week. Yes. <laughs> Andy's saving a day for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah why don't, um, we've got some questions here on um, that our audience has written down, so we'll get to those in a second. But do you just want to maybe, um, for those of us that don't know an awful lot about 1031 exchange, do you just want to explain kind of what it is and, and how we would need that? Absolutely. So a 1031 exchange is a section of the tax code that basically says if you're selling investment or business use property and you buy more investment or business use property of equal or greater value, you get to defer the taxes from that transaction. You do have to follow some rules, which you guys are probably going to be, some of you are going to be familiar with. Um, but specifically, I want to clarify, it is only for investment or business use property. So primary homes, second homes, Properties that are purchased with the intention of fixing and rese immediately reselling don't really fit the definition of an investment property as it pertains to a 1031 exchange. So if someone's selling a property that is a rental, for example, and it has appreciated in value and they don't want to pay the taxes, they do a 1031 exchange, work with uh, somebody like us, which is a qualified intermediary. Everything gets documented according to what the IRS regulations require. But the catch is they have to buy something, they have to buy property of equal or greater value. Now they can allocate that over one, two, three properties if they want to. The goal is to match value for value. So if you're selling a property that's 500,000 and you want to defer the taxes on that transaction, you ultimately need to acquire approximately $500,000 worth of real estate or more. You can buy for more. You can buy for less and possibly pay tax liability on the difference between what you sold for and what you ultimately reinvest in. But this is for anyone that owns property that they operate their business out of or any rental investment properties that they have. 1031 is truly a gift, if you can call it that, from the IRS tax code. <laughs> I'm not sure the IRS is in the habit of giving gifts, but we can see it. As <laughs> <laughs> I did, this is live recorded. I didn't say that. I, I retract my picture. Um, Tony, do you have anything you want to ask, Teresa? Um, I have more questions. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. before you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the reasons I was going to ask, or the question I was going to ask, Teresa, is um, why why we would use someone like yourselves if if we were looking to do a ten thirty one exchange? Why can I not do it myself? Why do I need a, an intermediary? That is a great question because I, I do get that a lot. And um, un unfortunately, it's just part of the what's written in the regulations that the taxpayer can't have constructive receipt of the proceeds from their sale. So it, it's just part of the rules that you got to play by. If you want to defer the taxes, then you got to use somebody like us. And to take it a step further, the QI or qualified intermediary has to be unrelated to the taxpayer. So it can't be the taxpayer's attorney or their CPA or even their real estate broker, for example, if, if they're being represented by that party in some other capacity, they can't use them as their qualified intermediary. So it's really important that they find that QI to facilitate the exchange. And most importantly, dear God, if you guys don't remember anything else, please remember you have to set it up before you close on your sale. We get a lot of people that call us after the fact and say, I closed on my sale last week, last month. Sometimes they say three months ago and they want to set up an exchange and we have to tell them it's too late. That must be hard news to deliver. 
it is it's so awkward when you get that silence and you're like i don't know what else to say right now <laughs> <laughs> um to, i was gonna say yeah, i had a really quick question um um i wanted to know um if it gets down to a situation where you clearly are not gonna you know be able to go like you didn't find a property or anything like that for your 31 exchange is there any type of like way that you can ask for an extension or anything like that or is it just like hard deadline no you suffer the consequences that is a great question unfortunately they're hard deadlines and they are based on calendar days so for those of you that don't know there are two deadlines you have to be mindful of you have 180 days from closing on your sale to complete your 1031 exchange and close on all intended purchases you have to identify what you're considering purchasing within the first 45 days of that 180 day period. If you don't meet the identification deadline, let's say you don't find anything or all the properties that you've identified, you no longer want to pursue and, and you just say, I'm, I'm out. You don't get to extend those deadlines. The only time there's an extension is if there's a natural disaster and there will be a, a ruling or a letter that's issued that dictates and outlines who's entitled to that extension. So if the deadline falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday, that's still technically the deadline. Perfect. Okay. Um, should we jump into audience questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah? sure. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you want to do written ones first? Or I know I have, we have a burning question at the back of the room. I yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie, go and check it out. The uh, question is, uh, you mentioned QI. What is a QI? If the QI is a thing, where do we find the state? If the QI is a person, where do we find this person? And, um, what, and, and what does this thing or this person do? So I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase that because I know you probably couldn't hear it. But um, our audience member at the back was asking basically what is a QI and um, mm -hmm. what, what do they do? And how do you find okay. them? Right? Okay, so QI stands for Qualified Intermediary. It is a, a third party that's there to facilitate the exchange and that's their sole function. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna handle your closing. They're not gonna find your, your replacement property in the exchange. They're there to solely escrow the proceeds from your sale and document the exchange. Um, where you find a QI, I'll be honest, for example, you know, we get a lot of our 1031 exchange business from referrals. So whoever you know in that room, if you come in and you're, you need a 1031 exchange, look around and ask the people that are around you, have you ever done one? And do you know of anyone that, that I can work with? Otherwise, there's good old fashioned Google or there's, um, there's a couple of specific websites that, um, actually give you a list of qualified intermediaries throughout the country. So there's a couple of different ways you could look for it, but the best way is always to talk to whoever you're, you're in contact with. And usually somebody knows somebody that, that they can refer to you. Teresa, and I know you're not here today, obviously in person. So we'll make sure that your contact information goes out to everyone that's here so that, um, okay. so that you're able to, I need to look Thank at you. the camera. Exactly. I wouldn't camera be very camera. good on TV, but I am. So we'll make sure that everyone receives your contact information. Okay. Um, Bunny, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. perfect. Um, all right, should we move on to some yeah. uh, audience questions? We'd be good TV hosts, oh, wouldn't we? I kind of uh, like uh, it. All right, go on, you can do the first okay. one. <laughs> Alrighty, um, this is a question. It says, uh, property has been rented for uh, past five years, but owner is not reporting income. Can he still do the 1031? If so, uh, would he need to amend past tax returns? Oh. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll say to the person who answered that question that it will remain anonymous. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm trying to think about this because I know that when you report the exchange, there is a specific form that you have to submit, which is form 88, IRS form 8824. I would say my concern would be, does, have you been renting the property out? Like when I'm talking to a prospective client, I'll ask them, how long have you owned it? Have you been renting it out? Whether or not you've been reporting that income is a conversation to have with your tax advisor. Because that, that's not necessarily something that we're going to be looking for. We're going to look to check off the box that you have been renting it. But if you haven't been reporting it, 
your tax advisor may say, we have no way of proving that this property qualifies because you haven't been reporting any income that you've generated. So I think that's more of a tax advisor question to see if there's some way to rectify that component so that if you do an exchange and it somehow comes up in the future, you've got yourself covered. But I guess um, <laughs> that's all I got on that yeah, one. No, that's, that's a great answer, thank you. Can we do a follow-up question on that, I guess, as well is, um, what kind of evidence do you um, collect then as, as a 1031 exchange intermediary? What are the, um, the pieces of evidence that you would need? So, uh, Anytime we speak with somebody, we'll, we'll kind of run through some questions. Like, like I said, you know, tell me a little bit about the, the property you're selling and the property that you're buying, because we need to, make, we've learned the hard way that just because they're selling a rental, sometimes they have the intention of buying something they're going to move into immediately, and that's not going to work. So the, the goal is, in terms of the property you're selling, have you owned it for at least one year or longer, and have you been renting it out? Uh, new property, are you planning on doing the same? You also have to make sure that you maintain the same taxpayer. So whoever owns the, the property you're selling, which is known as the relinquished property, you have to match that taxpayer on the new purchase. It's gotta be the same. So if you own a property, for example, individually, and you wanna buy something in the name of a partnership, that's not gonna work because you're not preserving the same taxpayer throughout the exchange. So in terms of collecting evidence, we don't necessarily require them to submit anything. We're just going to ask them and we're going to assume they're telling us the truth. Now, it gets fun when they tell us a little too much and we'll say, well, actually, <laughs> that may not qualify. And they'll say, well, hypothetically, let's say I was renting it for a year or longer. And I'm right. thinking, oh, God, OK, so this is a recorded line. So we're going to need to end this conversation. <laughs> um, yeah. So we don't require anything. At the end of the day, the burden is going to be on the taxpayer to prove the property should qualify and that they had the proper intention with it. Perfect. So I'm guessing, you know, from everything you've said so far, it's important that you have a, a good amount of involvement from your tax advisor at the same yes. time as working with the template exchange. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. Well, I'm excited about these questions because the person in the audience is in the process of um, of doing a template one exchange. So oh, okay. no, I was gonna say no. We have another audience question. Oh, do you want to do the audience yeah, question first? Yeah. Okay, yeah. we've got an audience question, then we we'll go to this. Okay. Um, yeah. So I have a couple questions, actually. Yeah. Uh, first one is if, you, if you're selling a residential property, can you do a 1031 exchange for a commercial property? Did you did you hear that one, Teresa? I'll I'll phrase it again. So basically, if you are um, selling a residential investment property, can you still use the ten thirty one exchange to purchase a commercial property? Oh, absolutely! All real estate qualifies as long as it's held for investment or business use. So you can go from residential rental to commercial property. Okay. And you had a follow-up question? Yeah. Um, can the sales price of the, for example, say you're selling a property that's for five hundred thousand, can you buy a property for less than that? Or more than that, like, is there is there a discrepancy there, or, or a cap there on the question? I'm I I'll try and remember all of that question. So basically, is there a a cap on the amount you can spend um, related to the property that you uh, sold? There's, that there, there's, so there you you can buy for as high a value as you want if the goal is tax deferral you want to buy property that's at least 500,000 or greater if you buy for a little bit less like let's say you buy for 450 and you sold for 5 then you might have some tax liability on that $50,000 difference between the values and at that point you'd have a partial exchange now i do want to clarify that you can off of your sales price subtract realtor commissions and any fees charged by the title company to get yourself a more specific number that you need to match or exceed in the exchange. So if title fees and realtor commissions total 50,000, for example, then um, your, your target number on your replacement property is gonna be 450,000 or greater, but there's no cap on how high you can purchase for. You just wanna make sure you get at least to that amount that's gonna equalize your exchange. Perfect. Alrighty, I'm going to jump into these written questions. So we have three, so prepare yourself. Okay. Um, what does it mean to identify a property in 45 days um, 
under contract question vague description i'll uh well you, you have a go at the first part and then i'll see what that's that's all about so um what does it mean to identify a property in four to five days um, so i i do get this question a lot in this current market it'd be great if you could be under contract um but technically identify simply means that you submit to whoever your qualified intermediary your list of target replacement properties and whatever they're currently selling for so when a client closes on their sale and we receive the proceeds, we let them know, hey, we've got the funds and now your clock has officially started. You have 45 days to complete this pretty little form where you can submit up to three properties of any value whatsoever. Uh, now, if you wanna identify more than three properties, you can, but there's gonna be a cap on the value that's identified. So if you can keep your list to three properties, there's no restriction on the value identified. But all they have to provide is the address and whatever the, the purchase price is of the property at the time of identification. Caveat with that, once you get past day 45, you cannot make changes to your list of identifications. So if all those properties fall through or if you determine that they're not going to work out, they're not really what you thought they were, you do not get to make changes once you're past day 45. So if you are able to negotiate a contract and get something in place or get as far in the process as you possibly can, that would certainly help to ensure that you can complete your exchange. Perfect. Um, so follow-up questions of this one. I think we kind of talked about this a little already, but I'll ask the question. Um, so if you're unable to close the property that you had in the contract within the 180 days, um, is there any kind of extension option if you are in the contract? No, I'm sorry to say no. <laughs> um, you know where we see this a lot is with new construction. And so forewarning to everyone that might consider it, new construction can absolutely be acquired as replacement property, but everybody needs to be on the same page that your 180th day is a hard deadline. You must take possession of the replacement property by that 180th day or it's not going to count. We've had people ask us, well, could we just go ahead and fund it and have it held in escrow somewhere? And then once they complete it, then we, we and get the CO, then we can close. Doesn't work that way. You have got to take possession of the property by day 180. Um, and then we've got one more question from this audience member. This is a good one. So who will submit the um, documentation for the 1031? Is it uh, the property owner, the attorney? Um, I guess who kind of works with you during the process? <sighs> So um, typically we work one on one with the client if they want to loop in their attorney or their, you know, their real estate agent, whoever we'll, we'll work with whoever we need to. A lot of times a lot of different people are giving us the documentation that we need, which is usually a copy of the contract for the sale or, or new purchase, and then just preliminary information from the taxpayer completing the exchange with that we prepare the documents for the client to sign and closing instructions for the title company or attorney that's handling the closing. At the very end, when they finish their exchange, we'll give them an accounting of all the incoming and outgoing funds. And then they'll, when they're ready to actually report the exchange to the IRS, that's gonna be on the taxpayer and their tax advisor to do that. We don't submit anything to the IRS. Perfect. Um, should we take some more audience questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, I was wondering about house hacking whether you can house hack and then do a 1031 on exchange on it, and whether you need to leave the property for a year and, and essentially have it as a residential property or a rental property or how that works. Do you want to rephrase that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Repeat, sorry, no, yeah, yeah. so essentially, um, the question is um, when you are doing a house hack, um, what does that look like for you? Like with the 231 exchange, do you have to leave the property for a year for it to be an actual full investment property or like, you know, kind of how, is that pretty much? Basically okay. if you've occupied part of the building. Yeah, right? the occupied, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so are we talking about one property that's been occupied and now you're going to vacate and you want to make it qualify for a 1031? Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, basically. So, so let's say it's a three flat that you purchased as your primary residence. So you've occupied one unit and then the other okay. two have been investment. Can, okay. Does that still qualify or how could you make it qualify? 
Yes, absolutely. So in that situation, you're just going to have to allocate. So you're probably going to sell everything at one sh in one shot. So the, the, the portion that you were occupying is excluded from the exchange and the other two units could be put into a 1031. You would just need to provide some sort of allocation of the sales price as to what's allocated to investment, the other part's going to be excluded because you're obviously living there. So you can that it, it's um, you can absolutely do 1031s where there's mixed use. You, you're just going to have to do a little extra legwork ahead of closing to make sure that everything's carved out and allocated to personal residence and investment property. I'm guessing would that be done through appraisal maybe like the appraisal would show the value given to the units that you weren't occupying or how would that work? Yeah. That, that's one way. Um, sometimes it, 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 that's probably the cleanest way. And especially if there are three separate units, it makes it a lot easier to designate what's investment. Like it gets fun when it's all under one roof or it's like, it's, it's not that clear cut. So yeah, I mean, whatever they can do to break it down for us for, for preparing the documents. And of course they're going to need that for um, another person that might be able to shed some light is perhaps their tax advisor too and see like how are they reporting it but any kind of allocation would work for us we're going to trust the client to give that give us accurate information yeah the, the theme i'm hearing all the way through this is consult your tax advisor as well at the same time because yeah. ultimately yes. it's be helping make sure that this is translated in your returns at the end of the year right Absolutely. So yeah, that is one, one distinction is that we're not the tax advisor. And so sometimes clients come to us and say, well, tell me what my tax liability is going to be, or should I do this? Or should I do that? We are not allowed to provide any sort of tax or legal counsel. So there may be questions that we could answer, but it doesn't mean that we should answer it. So definitely need to make sure that those parties are still involved and, and aware of what you're trying to do. There are some instances where a 1031 doesn't make sense. Like I'll have clients call me and say, I just talked to my CPA and he says, I don't need to do it. Okay, great. You know, that, that, that's one reason why you want to run it by them and make sure that they sign off on it. Okay. Um, other questions? Yeah. I was just going to say, I think if you've lived there two years, you don't have to pay tax on but that's only on the, like, let's say it's a three flat to live in one of them. Isn't that only on one? I think it's on the whole property you can live in and invest. I think it is broken up by your your percentage that you occupy. Like when you when you take all your expenses off for investment properties, you again write off the expenses for the unit you occupy that's the three flat. You can only write off 66% of the expenses because that other part is not Yeah. So if you sell it, when you sell it, when you sell it, if you've lived there for two years, you get to exclude. Sorry, Teresa, we're having a bit of a, a sub conversation. No, this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm hearing it. Yeah. So um, if you wanted to tax this, you could live in it for two years, sell your one third tax free up to 500000 and then the other two thirds you could do as a 1031 exchange and not have any tax liability. Right. Right. Like, like a lot of um, so yeah. I think what we'll what we'll do, Teresa, maybe next Q and A can be a tax expert, right? We should. We should uh, get no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tax expert. Yeah. 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 Um, let me just check this. Um, for those people who've tuned in on Zoom as well, if uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box um, as well. Tony, you got any other questions? I can't think of any. Um, yeah. You got another one? Yeah, I just had a general. Like, we talked about a little bit of some obvious mistakes that you might wait to make when you're doing a 1031 exchange, but what are some less obvious ones? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> just, I don't know how much of that you, you heard, but so some of the, you know, we talked about the obvious mistakes, some of the less obvious mistakes that we could maybe um, give people a heads up so they can avoid. Okay. Um, oh, here's a, here's a big one that I'm seeing a lot. Do not overfinance your new purchase. So, People grasp the concept of, okay, I know if I sell for 500,000, I need to buy for 500,000, but they neglect the fact that you need to roll over all the equity, all the, the proceeds from the sale into the new purchase and only finance what you need. 
what some people are doing is they're thinking, oh, well, as long as I buy for 500,000, I could finance for four. And then I'll just put a little bit of the proceeds in and take the rest out and put it in my pocket. That's not going to fly. So do not overfinance. only finance what you need. If you want to complete the exchange, do a refi after the fact and take some cash out. If, if, if you just want access to some cash, do it that way, because anything that's not reinvested from your sale is going to be subject to tax liability. So in that scenario where if we're returning a bulk of the proceeds to you, you're really not getting any benefit from the exchange. That is that is a big one. And um, also, um, I think the issue of not maintaining the same taxpayer. Sometimes people will, if it's a husband and wife and they want to buy in their um, LLC, for example, that they both own. Yes, I understand they both own it, but a lot of times those are classified as, as partnerships versus the two individuals. It depends on how the LLC is set up, but it's very, very important not to take that misstep of um, violating that same taxpayer requirement. Second thing is people want to add other people to the deed of the property that they're purchasing. If you're buying a way more expensive property, then that could possibly work. But if you're barely equalizing your exchange and you want to add your spouse or a friend to the deed to the replacement property, you do not get credit for what that person takes title to, that interest that that person takes title to. So be careful with that. Um, most commonly comes up with husband and wife, okay? So perhaps the wife owns the property individually and just in her name that she's selling. She wants to buy the new replacement property and have her husband on the deed because, you know, of course, why not? But for the exchange, he's not part of the exchange. So she needs to make sure that she's the only one on the deed to the property because anything that he takes title to does not get credited towards her exchange. Right. She can eventually add him. But it's it, you got to make sure that you follow the rules of the exchange, wait a little bit, and then you can add whoever you want to the deed later. Right, and I know you mentioned about the refinance, so maybe that's something that you can do uh, when you're taking some cash out, right? Yeah, um, exactly. If, as a lender speaking, generally, um, you have to make six payments before you refinance. Just, just <laughs> yeah, throw that out there. Yeah. Um, oh, good. <laughs> so that's interesting because I hear people say, so I got to wait six months before I can refine. Like, where'd they get that from? So, okay, there you go. Yeah, that, I learned some payments, things. Six payments is the general rule, so. Okay. Um, Landon, you had another question. Yeah, that was a follow-up to this entity. Um, Concept if you're able to change or add or basically form an LLC with an added person before the exchange, then there should be no issue, right? That new entity, that new LLC, then is the one that is purchasing the new property. Um, so, Teresa, did you, did you, it seems like you heard that, did you? I did. I did. You want to okay. be very careful about not changing who owns the relinquished property if you're close to closing. So, Remember, so for example, I, th I think if you're if you own it and then you want it, you ultimately want your LLC to be on the replacement property deed, but you own it individually and you want to put like a, a, a partnership LLC as the exchanger. If you do that immediately prior to closing, then you're changing the taxpayer on the deed, and this new taxpayer will not have held that relinquished property for long enough prior to the exchange. Because whenever you change who owns the property that you're selling, you're going to start a new clock, a new holding period um, leading up to the exchange. So if you plan far enough ahead of time, you can do this. But if, if we're like weeks out or um, if it's pretty close to closing on the sale, don't make any changes. Sometimes people too, they, it goes the opposite way. There's an LLC that owns the relinquished property and not everyone wants to do the exchange. So then they think, oh, well, well, we'll just eat it out of the LLC and into the individual member names, and then everyone can go their separate ways and decide what, whether they want to exchange or not. Again, that's a problem if you are already under contract to sell and you're leading up to closing. It's known as a drop and swap. Don't want to do that because those get audited and those are actually not a good thing. So plan well enough in advance if you think that there's any chance that somebody's not going to want to go through and do an exchange, have that discussion early so you can make the necessary changes, but don't do anything once you're under contract. 
ideally you'd want to make changes to the property at least a year out. And then I was going to add to that as well, Teresa, just um, remember that a residential loan can't close as an LLC. So if you, if you want it in your LLC, you need to close it in a person's name before it's owned by the LLC. So uh, good to mention that. Yeah. Could you repeat the drop and swap again, please? Um, could you repeat drop and swap? Teresa? Yes. So a drop and swap is where your, your relinquished property is currently held in the name of an LLC, a multi-member LLC. And not all the members want to move forward and do an exchange. So what they'll do is they'll take the property out of the LLC name, deed it into the individual member name. So now it's held as tenants in common. And then they move forward with the sale. Some of the members can exchange. Some of them can elect to just cash out. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we mentioned, Teresa hasn't been well. <laughs> so four things haven't a bit. So we'll do a little bit of fill. Um, while, while we're waiting for Teresa to come back, did anyone want to add um, any questions that we can ask when she's uh, yeah. feeling better? Yeah. One question that I had was, what if you kind of want to do things in the office? Let's say, like my situation, um, I want to sell a property. I have a property, but um, my tenant's lease expired at the end of July. Okay. But I found a property that I really like. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that I can structure um, an offer that I put in to where it's like, okay, I want to get under contract now, do it that in four months, I want it to attend the real exchange. Interesting. Know? So I think, I think Teresa's actually covered that a little bit, right? Was okay, that sorry. you, um, no, no, that's fine. Um, it might be before you got here, actually, that the, um, you need to have enlisted the support of the tenant that you want to exchange intermediary before you go into contract, right? Okay. Do yeah. I understand that? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. does, does that kind of yeah. relate to? Uh, I don't know if there's something you could do with like maybe you just write a contract differently to where you know how to kind of like express an interest in the property, right? Is that yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Express an interest in the property and say that in four months, five months, I know it's a hot market, so that you know selling me right. accept that, mm -hmm. but just you know, maybe um if you've seen something. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, Teresa, are you feeling okay? Sorry about that. I'm so sorry. No, 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 it's like, we, did, we did a little bit of filling while you were gone. Um, so do you want to just finish drop and swap, and then we've got another another question. Yeah. So the drop and swap is is basically just needing it into the individual member names. The issue is the timing when that's done. Most often, people don't figure out that they want to do that until right before closing, and that's the problem. If you do it a year in advance, there's no problem, but it, you're, you're dropping it from a, a partnership taxpayer to individuals that own it. So let's say you do that a month before closing. Each individual member will have only owned their interest in the property for a month before the exchange. They will not have held that property for long enough to qualify as a 1031 exchange property. It's a small distinction, but you're changing who ultimately owns the property. Does that make sense? Like it's, it you're, you're, even though it's the, the members, you know, the original members, the taxpayer is technically the partnership. And now it's dropping down to individual owners who are technically selling their interest in a short period of time. Um, Teresa, and then the, the other question that we had was um, kind of about timelines. So in terms of um, kind of getting something under contract, right? Is there any way of, um, Kind of having like an unofficial contract on a property that you're interested in or some way to express interest in something before the 1031 exchange starts is that yeah let's, you know, yeah yeah let's say you want to buy you find a property now uh, but you want to do a 1031 exchange in august is there any way to set up your buyer's contract to kind of show that right D did you hear that Kind of if you if you find a property now that you were interested in being part of the 10th that you won't exchange, but you didn't want to do it until yeah, let's say in the future. Want to, yeah, exactly. You want to sell the property in August, so it's taking more time, obviously. So and and so the purchase wouldn't close until after closing on your sale in August. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. You don't have to have the QI in place to go under contract for a new purchase. The problem's going to be, well, not problem. Let me, let me, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. You can go <laughs> under contract for the new purchase. You want to try and make it though contingent on your sale closing so that you can avoid doing what's known as a reverse exchange, which is a whole nother discussion. Um, but a reverse exchange allows you to buy first, then sell. It is much more involved. And I'm going to be honest with you. It can be challenging to get those done. 
because our role in that is a little more involved and it, it requires a separate third party title holder coming in and basically holding that property for you until you close on your sale. So the cleaner, easier way to do this is you can go under contract, but as long as it doesn't close until you close on your sale, after you close on your sale, that's totally fine. Perfect. I think should we do one more question? If, yeah. if anybody, yeah. there was one last, maybe maybe we'll do two. We'll do two. Yeah. I don't think we do two. Ah. Two last yeah. questions. Yeah. Let's go deeper. People that earn interest on the money while they're, well, it's an escrow. Like, let's say you, you can have millions of dollars wrapped up in a 1031. It's sitting there for like you know, five or six months. It doesn't go into an interest bearing account, does it? I don't know if you heard that one. Um, basically, can you earn interest on the money that sat in the, the 1031 account? It I'm going to be honest. It depends on the qualified intermediary. Uh, as, as far as we're concerned, our default is it does not earn interest. If the client wants to earn that, we could certainly arrange that or keep the interest that's earned. It depends on the QI, though, so ask. Question. Um, and then your very last question to be so I promise then you can uh, go and recover from your, your sickness. Um, <laughs> last question at the back. On an existing law, that's where everyone exchanged if there's a taxable defense, when do you pay those taxes on the uh, gains? Okay, perfect. Um, so, so that was probably right from the back of the room, so I don't know whether you, whether you got that. So basically, let's say um, there was a taxable event, sorry, a taxable event during the 10th that you went exchange, when would you pay the taxes on that? Um, when you actually report the, the, the 1031 on your tax return. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep. Great. Cool. Um, all right, Teresa, thank you so much for joining us, especially while you're not feeling well. It was really kind oh, of- Oh, thank uh, you for having me. <laughs> um, so much knowledge. So I've, I've learned a lot. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, we're about yeah. to close our first 1031, but yeah. even I know more now than I did then. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things I can tell it's really good to, to have a good team up front, uh, get to know people and have a really strong tax advisor so that um, they're on board for the process. So yes. um, thank you so much for joining us. Have you got any uh, last comments? Um, no, no, but thank you so much, Teresa. I, like, like Andy said, we're in the middle of closing our um, deal together on a 1031 exchange and it was it's been a little rocky road before he got involved with it because we had another lender involved with it stop it Tim. but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know that 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 is actually where a lot of clients run into bumps get a make sure you have a good lender because that that can literally blow things up in the 11th yeah. hour i've seen more exchanges blow up because of that than anything else so Everybody yeah. should make sure they have Andy's info then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the so reach out to Andy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, promise I promise I'm not paying any of these people. This is no. <laughs> um, all right, guys, well, we'll wrap it up there. Teresa, thank you so much. We'll make sure everyone gets your contact information um, after this. Right. And um, we'll keep in touch. Thank you right. so much. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care. Wait to the oh, Bye. yeah. I'll keep it in the camera right here. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.